What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you another Divinity Lore video, this time about a much requested topic, none other than the God King. So, who is he? What's he all about? That's what we're going to get into. However, quick warning, tons of spoilers, primarily for Divinity Original Sin 2, maybe some for Original Sin and like a couple other games here and there, but like mostly lore stuff, not necessarily like anything plot related for the other games, that is. Whereas Divinity Original Sin 2, I'm going to be spoiling quite a bit of. So with that in mind, the God King is a character that is only in Divinity Original Sin 2. As someone who has played and done story videos for every single Divinity game, he is only in Divinity Original Sin 2. So who is the God King? The God King was actually the leader of the Eternals before they discovered the Veil of Source. Now, the Eternals and the God King had eight barons. Now, you'll notice I said eight and not seven. I'll have a video linked down below about the eighth baron who eventually became Chaos, the demon god, as opposed to one of the seven gods that you're probably more familiar with, as Chaos does not feature prominently in the more recent storylines, though he is a big character in the lore. Eight barons, not seven. Enter Fane, the Eternal, from Divinity Original Sin 2. As you will know if you played through his origin story, Fane is none other than the Eternal Scholar who actually discovered the Veil of Source that surrounds Rivalon and protects it from outside influences, otherwise known as the Void. Now, upon the discovery of the Veil of Source, the eight barons overthrow the God King so they can claim the Source Veil for themselves which is what they do, and they take this opportunity to banish the rest of the eternal race, besides a few here and there, such as Fane and others probably, presumably, but suffice to say, they cast out the Eternals, and moreover, and more importantly, the God King himself. Now, it's worth mentioning that once they gathered this Source Veil, this is where Chaos, the Demon God, actually splits off. So, rather than use the power of Source to become divine, it is said that he somehow corrupted the divine power of Source and turned it into something less divine, shall we say. And that's how he transformed himself into the demon god and then went on to create demons and then eventually warred with the seven. But again, video about that down below. Now, with the other seven gods actively in control of all Source, creating their races, essentially creating the cycle of life and death that continually feeds them Source, they are able to maintain this barrier between Rivalon and the Void, which keeps the God King sealed out. This is part of the huge lore that was added with Divinity Original Sin 2. Then we bring ourselves to 1233. This is when Lucian, who had become the Divine in 1218, death fogs a bunch of elves in his fight against Damien, the Damned One. Again, all these characters I have lore videos about, I'll try to link them down below if I remember to do it. This is a critical mistake for Lucian. Lucian death-fogging these elves was a really bad move. Not necessarily because of the obvious implications and the fact that, you know, genocide is generally frowned upon. Simply that in killing so many elves all at once, he actually weakened the god of the elves, Tyrsindilius. Losing so many followers so quickly gave him less access to the source that those elves would gather throughout their lives and then shed, which he would then feed on, as a god. This weakens Tyrsindilius, which creates a crack in the source veil because he's no longer able to maintain it. This is what allows the god king and his void to start slipping back in. This is when we start to see in Divinity Original Sin 2, where... Again, Lucian fakes his death because he has his whole plot that's not super related to what we're doing right now. But at this point, using this crack in the veil that was made, the God King starts sending his influence in. This is when Voidwoken start attacking sorcerers who use Source. This is when the God King starts forming covenants with people. Now, it's important to note that this is where the God King assumes control of the Black Ring. The Black Ring normally answers to Damien, who is an avatar of Chaos. It's worth mentioning that the God King and Chaos aren't like aligned. They are two separate entities. It's unclear whether or not they would get along or anything like that. We don't know. But what we do know is that Damien, in his absence from the Black Ring, leaves a leadership vacuum. And so the God King makes contact with these Black Ring people and essentially they start swearing covenants to him. Now this is especially interesting because we know, because of the canon lore, that Damien, who had been banished to Nemesis in 1233 during that war with Lucian, actually escaped Nemesis, which is a separate dimension, in 1238. 
Divinity Original Sin 2 takes place in 1242. So why Damien was absent and why he let the God King have control of the Black Ring during this time is unclear. We don't even know what Damien was doing right in these few years. Now the other thing I want to talk about at this moment is the covenants the God King was making. These covenants are interesting because undead existed before this by like in droves. They're all over the place. In fact, in the time of Dragon Commander, which was like 10,000 years before this, undead were actually a very ultra-religious society that believed they were raised by the gods themselves in some sort of second life fashion. On the flip side of this, the God King seems to be making covenants with people that when they die, he can essentially force them to rise up and continue living and serving his will. Now, it seems like this is meant to be an, an allusion to like a Faustian bargain because the God King is the winner here. Like he essentially owns your soul. When you die, you will not go to the Hall of Echoes like normal. Even in the absence of gods, that still seems to happen. However, the God King seems to lay claim to the source or souls or whatever you want to talk about of these people that have sworn covenants and they go to wherever his realm is in the void. We know this because we can talk to several spirits of these people as they're being pulled to the void to go to wherever the God King is. So just two points I wanted to talk about there. And then from here, we're going to talk about what the ultimate goal of the God King was during Divinity Original Sin 2, which is huge plot spoilers. So as I mentioned, Lucian made that mistake of killing all these elves, weakening Tyrus and Dilius empowering the god king by direct result the void woke and start seeping in attacking sorcerers this is when we see sorcerers starting to be rounded up and sent to fort joy which of course kicks off the events of the game but more importantly what is the god king's goal in this well we're going to skip past a bunch of story to talk about that if you're interested in the full story i have full story videos i think it's like three hours long the god king is simply trying to take back what he feels is rightfully his that the baron stole all the barons that is stole all the source from this veil and kicked the entire eternal race out not just the god king if you remember the eternals have devolved if you want to see it that way into void woken and we can get some of this information from void woken and the god king himself throughout the game specifically i think at the academy of the seven i believe is where this happens we can have a conversation where they explain that having been kicked out into the void which is not a very hospitable place as you might imagine the eternals and the god king had no one to turn to so they turned to the void and made some sort of agreement where they could you know live out there but it woefully transformed most of the Eternals into the Void Woken Beasts that we see. The God King himself seems to have maintained a great deal of power throughout this transformation that we can, of course, learn about. We don't know the full extent of it, but it seems to be, at the very least, able to rival a God's power. Now, I think that's important because I think it implies, personally, that the God King serves someone else. In order for him to have made this pact with the Void, so to speak, there has to be a separate entity that he is speaking to. That's the way I interpret it. I guess you could say that he made a pact with the Void as like a cosmic being, so to speak. I guess there is that angle. However, me personally, I think there was an entity that he made an agreement with that he serves himself. But anyways, throughout Divinity Original Sin 2, the God King and his Void Woken are simply trying to claim every scrap of source they possibly can for themselves, culminating with ideally the God King claiming divine power for himself thus becoming kind of the divine and becoming like this awful ruler, right? Obviously, through the game, we know that that doesn't work out. We stop that from happening, which leads into all of the endings of Divinity Original Sin 2. I want to mention, and this is probably the most important part because it sets up future games, the God King doesn't die in any of them. In the best ending, and what is considered the canonical ending, more than likely due to the fact that Fallen Heroes marketing kind of pointed that direction, is the world being purged of Source, permanently restoring the Veil, permanently forcing the God King, and potentially the Eternals, depending on your origin character, into the Void forever. Now again, that's interesting because even in that ending, the God King does not die. Now, in some of the non-canon endings, he can actually take over Rivalon if you reject Divinity, and so does everyone in your party. That's a fun one. And then origin character Fane has some endings directly relating to the God King, where he can choose to serve the God King. He can actually choose to bring back the Eternals, but leave the God King out. And undead characters 
can actually swear a covenant to the god king himself, which can be broken, of course, through in-game means, but it's interesting that the undead can join that covenant. So there you go, guys. Uh, probably not as much as you hoped, at least personally. I wish there was more information about this guy as well. But there is everything there is to know about the God King of the Eternals, really. I'll try to link some of those other lore videos down below so you guys can kind of piece together what you think about it. But that's essentially everything we know about the God King because, again, he's only in the one game and he's not even like really, really in the game. He's more of this off-screen character that we don't really engage with besides at, like specific moments. So... Thank you guys so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. <laughs>